This is a teaching moment for those of us who've been watching this. We, we've known about this for decades. You've been covering this for many, many years. And I'm wondering how you account for the persistence of active management. There, there's three points the report seems to make here. First is that the market the concept of market timing doesn't really work. It's hard to be right going in and, and going out. Uh, high fees and commissions erode alpha. That seems to be the second point here. And, and third, uh, I hear this from my old buddy Larry Swedrow all the time, more professionals are competing against other professionals. It's just harder because it's, there, there's just fewer uh, individuals in the market and more professionals to compete against. So sort of sum up this for us. How, how do you account for the persistence of active management? Are, are they selling us something that we want to believe but isn't really true? I mean, riff on this for a minute. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, we've talked about fees already, Bob, so that's that's really foundational. I, I think the other point that Larry rightly picked up on is just the dynamic of the market itself. It's not that these managers, these portfolio managers, there's teams of analysts aren't incredibly bright, skilled, uber intelligent, well equipped. They're as bright, skilled, intelligent, as well equipped as they've ever been. So we've moved long past the days of Harlem Globetrotters versus Washington Generals, where professionals could pick on a large contingent of individual retail traders uh, and, and get out ahead of them and outsmart them. It's now kind of wash Harlem Globetrotters versus Harlem Globetrotters, NBA All-Star Game, whatever you want to call it. This isn't you know LeBron versus me in a pickup game. This is LeBron versus himself. So the level of skill that you see, especially in the U.S. market, is as high as it's ever been. It's as hotly competitive as it's ever been. So it's harder than ever to eke out alpha. And if you want to look at a contrast there, my colleagues in China actually have done a similar analysis of the Chinese funds market, where there's a huge active retail investor base. And what you see is that 90 plus percent of actively managed mutual funds in China managed to beat their indexed peers. So I, I think this is you know, one proof point uh, of one of the most fundamental factors that, that drives what we see in this analysis. Yeah, Swedro likes to say the pool of victims is shrinking in the U.S., meaning retail uh, investors who are not as sophisticated. We'll get to that in a minute here. But I, I, Ed, uh, you're a guy. You, you, you uh, oversee a, a several actively managed ETF. You, let me look at some of your holdings here. You run the Advantis U.S. Equity ETF, AVUS. Yeah. Now, explain how you pick stocks. I'm looking at this, and again, this looks mostly like high-quality tech and pharma here. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, Johnson & Johnson. I, I see these in a lot of funds these days, but what's the criteria you use for picking funds? So think of for AVUS, for example, think of it more as a, a modern approach to active management where it's combining the, you know, the, what you get from indexes, which is diversification and low fees, but instead of relying on the index or waiting for a rebalance period, which may be monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, even annually, the portfolio managers are looking at it every day to account for the, the things they want to account for, right? So they're not just looking for the things you would normally look at market cap. They're also looking at balance sheet and profitability, and you're combining what goes with an index along with an active management in a, what you could call a best of both worlds for that situation. And so with something like AVUS, you get the full diversification and you get it at a pretty reasonable price at 15 basis points. So that's why you would say that it goes back to the fee discussion that we just talked about. And it also is combining different things that make it attractive to both index and active users. Yeah, and I'm, you're putting up here, we're putting up the advantage small cap value, that's done well this year, but small caps have done fairly well. And, you know, we know yep. historically, not, not to get into, you know, academic studies like, you know, from a French two-factor, uh, we, we know that small cap and value, two factors, do tend to outperform over time, although they, they have not in many, many years. So you're sort of in that sweet spot this year where some parts of the year, small cap and value, have done, have done very, very well. Do, do you still... I'm asking a generic question, Ed, but do you still believe in the concept of small cap and, and value as factors that are will long-term outperform? I mean, I do. And it, let's add into that what the portfolio managers also account for. They also account for like balance sheet, profitability as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that tilt towards small cap and value, which I think over the long term can outperform. And you'll see periods of underperformance with that. But if you hold it for a long period of time, it will outperform, but when you start yeah. adding in 
other metrics like a profitability or looking at the balance sheet and taking into account what makes a company a good company, it actually gives you more of an advantage as well. Right. Yeah. Over time, you should be able to outperform by even more. And if, if that graphic right. of AVUV, I'm sure, in the last year has shown a huge yeah. outperformance. The problem uh, Ed, is, is uh, over time, small cap might outperform big cap. Uh, and uh, you might see other little outperformances elsewhere. Uh, but it may take a long time. And it's, it, the small cap people and the value people have been waiting many years for a little bit of outperformance. Jerome, I want to turn to you. Active bond phone, uh, funds did well in lower volatility as well. You're the bond fund guy. While I've got you here, give us your take on where interest rates are going today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, interest rates are obviously been in flummox uh, really over the past week, especially front end rates at this point in time. Uh, the digestion and trying to figure out exactly where the landing point is for inflation is obviously front and center, not just here in the United States, but globally. You know, supply chain constraints, labor economics, things like this, the employment cost index from last week. These are all factors which are ultimately going to figure out and, and really come into construct of how the term premium plays out. So long story short is we are probably in for a period more immediately of a little bit higher inflation, which will effectively moderate as we get into 2022. Um, and it's going to create a little bit of tension, especially for the Federal Reserve, who's going to have to be a little bit more patient as the digestion for inflation actually occurs. And we see some of these supply hindrances come back yeah. online and alleviate some of this, some of this uh, effect. I think one of the key points, though, here, uh, Bob, is really this. When you think about where we've come from, in fact, where we've come from, what we used to call the, the new normal, um, doesn't really apply anymore. And I think that era of low rates and low volatility has gone by the wayside. Now, when we get into this area of a more new neutral policy, that effectively means that the cycles are a little bit shorter. Uh, the amplitudes of the cycles are probably a little bit more severe, higher and lower. And as a result, when we think about the response function, the response function is probably going to be a little bit more passive, patient uh, from the Federal Reserve, especially if they see spikes a little bit beyond their comfort level for inflation. So ultimately, when they bring that inflation back in closer to that 2 percent PCE, which is well above higher at this point in time, then they're going to actually find a little bit more runway, not necessarily to be in that rate hiking sequence at all. So our forecast for rate hikes is probably uh, still 2023, maybe it pushed uh, very into late 2000. 2022. But right now, we think that inflation begins to moderate, and that will give the Fed a little bit more leniency in terms of how yeah. they respond to so the current over conditions. the weekend, everybody was talking about Goldman Sachs call about maybe rates starting to hike in July of 2022. Doesn't that seem a little early to you? I know this is Goldman making the call, but, you know, it, yeah, it, it, I it think seems like an aggressive I, I, call to me. Well, it seems aggressive, but frankly, that's where the market's pricing right now. And when you look at, you basically have a 44% uh, chance of probability of a hike in June, uh, and you probably have two hikes priced in uh, fully for the 2022. So the market is actually there uh, in, into that construct. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily off the market. It's probably more consensus yeah. if you want to actually look at the market. I think what is important, though, is understanding how the digestion actually occurs. So you have to take a view on, or is the inflation that we're seeing actually getting baked into the psychology, into the framework, into the long-term inflationary expectations of the investor. If you don't believe so, and the Fed doesn't at this point in time, but we'll find out more later this week, then you're going to actually see that those rates rise potentially if that inflation uh, gets, gets carried away. If it doesn't, then you're going to see a Fed okay. be more patient, not necessarily uh, hiking twice in 2022. That's the tension okay. right now.